Okay, Christine and Ritu, why don't we go ahead and get started? There'll be other folks I'm sure hopping on as well, but I'm Dan Kohler with Sindio, and I'll just preview for us uh, a quick agenda in terms of what to expect today with the session. Thank you, Joni. We'll do just some quick housekeeping. We'll cover statutory pay reporting and, and provide a global look. Um, we'll also dig into the EU directive that is here and talk about getting ready for change, the need for a coordinated strategy. Um, just four quick points of housekeeping. One is um, to use the Q&A or chat feature to submit questions if you have them. We'll try to answer as we go, but we'll follow up with questions that we don't address. Just to flag for you, you have the option to submit anonymously through the Q&A portion, but we then won't be able to follow up with you directly with an answer. Um, if we don't cover it in today's webinar. So just a heads up, if you'd like a response, please do uh, submit using your name. We will send out today's deck and recording of the event. We'll have um, the live transcript, uh, excuse me, we have the live transcript enabled for this webinar. So if you'd like to use this feature, uh, you can turn it on now in your Zoom setting toolbar. And then a quick disclaimer, Christine, uh, who I'll introduce in a second, is an attorney, but nothing contained in this webinar is intended as legal advice, nor should anything we say be regarded as such. Thank you, Joni. We'll move ahead. For, by way of quick intros, um, again, Dan Kohler, uh, Regional Vice President of Sales with Cindio. I've um, been in HR analytics for the last seven years, helping leaders have confidence in their compensation and workplace equity practices so that they can recruit and retain top talent. Um, Christine Hendrickson has 15 years of experience in employment law. Christine works in the uh, intersection of HR analytics and the law. She partners with employees to provide strategic, practical, cutting edge, real world best practice advice on pay equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics. Before joining Cindy o, Christine was a partner and co chair of the pay equity group at Seifarth Shaw LLP. Ritu Mohanka has 20 years' experience in senior leadership roles with HR and talent focused businesses, including leading business development and strategic growth efforts in EMEA at Glint, now LinkedIn. Prior to Glint, Ritu worked at Conexa, IBM, Smarter Workforce to uh, drive rapid revenue growth across the EMEA region. A quick background on Syndio, if for folks that don't know us yet, Syndio's clients leverage our platform and guidance to achieve workplace equity. We work with companies that you see here on the screen, but many more wonderful teams um, confidentially as well. What our clients tell us they love uh, about working with us is our combination of leading technology and expert advice. With that, I'm gonna turn it over, starting with the next slide here to Christine. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And you know, thank you so much for all of you um, that are joining. Today is, for me, a really exciting day um, because we're kind of officially launching um, Cindio's Global Pay Reports, um, which is our, Dan will talk about um, a bit more, but it's something that we've been working on with Ritu um, and with so many of the domain um, experts on our team, Andrea um, Palmeter, Jonathan Vidales, um, many, many, many more that are behind that effort. So it's a really exciting day for us kind of at Cindio. Um, but frankly, the reason that we started, we um, are launching our global pay report support is because we were seeing kind of down the line that things were changing in a really big way. Um, and that employers that had previously only had kind of one global strategy, which was a global pay analysis strategy. So making sure that, you know, in similar employees that were doing similar work within um, a geographic area were paid um, equally. And that is truly so fundamentally important to how employers think about their global, their global populations. But we were also seeing that the world was changing in a pretty substantial way around global pay reporting. And that is because, as Ritu is gonna get, um, walk us through in, in more detail, we have on the horizon the EU directive, which will require that all 27 member states in the EU um, do public global pay reporting. And that lays on top of all of the global reporting requirements that are that are currently required. And so 
as employers have gone from an, of an approach that was largely de maybe decentralized, maybe more centralized, but um, often kind of not coordinated as like a single, vo you're not speaking about your global pay reporting with a single voice. We were feeling like that was something that um, that we were hearing kind of more and more that that's just such an important um, part of telling your pay equity story. So I think what we wanted to talk about kind of most fundamentally today is the fact that you really need two strategies on global reporting, or excuse me, you need two global strategies on pay equity. You need a strategy around ensuring that you're that you're analyzing employees across your entire population, um, often kind of country by country, maybe in regional roll-ups with maybe a look, um, a look on top um, with a global lens. But you also need, and I think that this is going to be newer for many employers, which is a global pay reporting strategy. Um, is that are your are you in compliance with the pay equity reporting laws in the countries that you operate? Are you actually filing the required reports? But frankly, that's table stakes. It's really, are you able to tell your story in a way that's coordinated so that you're not kind of analyzing your median pay gap in one country in one way and you're doing it kind of differently in another, in another um, location and you're not telling a consistent story because it becomes, as these reports become much more public, um, something that is going to be um, kind of needed. So, Joni, if you might take us to the next slide, we can talk about kind of where, where we are. What's the global reporting state of the state? So throughout this um, presentation, we're going to be talking about your global strategy broadly, but we're going to be narrowing in specifically on the strategy that you may want to consider adopting around global pay reporting. Um, so currently, um, there are global pay reporting laws in 29 um, in 29 jurisdictions um, around the globe. These are concentrated kind of in three areas. Um, the Americas, we have global reporting um, in the Americas in, in some countries, as you can see in the US, it's a little bit spat, um, scattered um, in terms of where that's required. Heavily concentrated in Europe, um, in with global reporting, um, many, many global reporting requirements in Europe, and then kind of elsewhere around kind of rest of world, we're seeing, um, we're seeing that concentration. So if we wanted to double click into that a little bit more um, on the next slide, Joni, um, what we see is kind of exactly what we said, which is 18 of the 29 jurisdictions sit within Europe. Um, five jurisdictions, Canada, many jurisdictions in Canada actually, but there's also a national law. So we counted, we counted Canada as one, although there's actually kind of many reporting laws that, that cover in Canada um, through, through different provinces. Um, there's some type of global reporting in Chile, not, not in the kind of traditional way that we think of it perhaps, um, but there is some reporting requirements in Chile. Um, and then in the United States, in California, with, with the requirement um, for, to file your um, pay, pay reports with um, the state of, of California, with the um, Civil Rights Division in California, a requirement in Illinois um, that is new first year for that um, reporting requirement, and that's an ongoing kind of rolling requirement. It's the second year for California um, with the pay reports due next month um, in California. And then in Minnesota, we have um, pay reporting requirements that just hit state, con uh, state contractors. So if you have a contract with a certain state contractors with the state of Minnesota, also have global reporting um, certification obligations in Minnesota. In Europe, the pay reporting obligations are quite widespread. Um, from Austria all the way to Ukraine, we have, um, we have reporting requirements. Some of them are kind of better known to, um, and some of them are, are reporting requirements where it may not require kind of a public report in the way that we see, um, in the way that we see in, for example, in the UK or in Ireland, some of them require only um, either kind of maintaining registries 
um, or filing or filing those reports um, directly as as a portion of a larger report or the like. Um, but fairly widespread reporting requirements across across Europe, certainly the concentration on the global reporting front. And then, but it's not just in those two in those two kind of in the Americas and in Europe, but we also see reporting requirements in Australia, in India, new laws um, in Israel, updated in Japan, some modified reporting requirements in, in Korea, and then in South Africa, kind of one portion of a, of a larger report. Um, so this meets, makes up the 29 jurisdictions across the world where we see reporting requirements before the EU directive is transposed. So what we find though, is that the world has really changed in a pretty big way just last, just at the very end of last month. Um, on the next slide, you can see this quote from um, Samira Raffaella, who was one of the um, rapporteurs of the um, EU Equal Pay and Transparency Directive. Um, she is uh, a member of parliament from the Netherlands. She is part of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee. And she, um, along with um, two other, really a kind of team of, uh, of many, um, were able to finally move through a just massive um, piece of legislation that will require um, significant changes to this, to this landscape. And so what she said is, not only do we finally have binding measures to tackle the gender pay gap, um, but there's also protections against pay discrimination and non-binary people have the same right to information as men and women um, for the very first time um, in, in Europe. And that just happened um, with a final vote kind of at the end of last month. Um, and then it will go through kind of final council agreement publication in the um, in the um, in, in the official report and then after 20 days, it goes off to each of the 27 member states to adopt um, and transpose that law into local law. But what it means, as, as we too will talk about in more detail, is it means that there's mandatory pay reporting that will be public in all 27 member states um, ac across Europe. Um, and so that will take us from that 29 jurisdictions that we currently have to on the next slide, we'll see that that increases all the way to 43 jurisdictions after that, um, where we went from just 18 jurisdictions in Europe that had pay, mandatory pay reporting, um, global pay reporting requirements, that increases all the way to 32 jurisdictions um, in Europe. We would expect, we would guess, like if we were kind of all future seeing, we've talked about this a lot that kind of Ritu, Dan and I think that if we look out down the line three, five years, we think that what we're seeing happening in Europe with this kind of rise of jurisdictions that will require mandatory pay reporting, we think that this will, we will also see those numbers um, in the Americas um, and the rest of world continue to increase. Um, and and Ritu is going to talk about that in a little bit more. Um, however, not only does it mean that there are 14 new uh, countries for whom there will be new pay reporting, and those are you know Bulgaria and Croatia and Cyprus and Czechia and and the, and the list all the way down to Slovenia um, that will that currently don't have a global pay reporting law, but will require public pay gap reporting after the EU directive is transposed within their jurisdiction. But it also means that the reporting will be modified by the EU directive and another 13 countries. So the ones that like are currently, we have reporting obligations in places like France and Germany and Ireland, um, but those will all be amended because none of those jurisdictions 
have the exact same requirements as what's required um, by the EU directive. So we're really talking about 27 of the 32 countries with global reporting requirements in the in Europe. There's um, and that's you know a sizable portion of Europe is is covered by that by by these kind of changes of what's to come. Um, and I think that it's really just these five Iceland, the folks that are not part of the um, not part of the European Union, like Iceland and Norway and Switzerland um, and the UK, Ukraine, that have current reporting requirements. Um, but I, one of the things that we're going to talk about, and you're totally right. So Martha said that non-federally regulated employers in Canada um, was. Um, Martha had a really great um, point on Canada. Um, well, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it, Martha, um, on Canada. But you're you're a hundred percent right on that. Um, is that we're seeing kind of changing a changing landscape. So all of this is to say that we're in a place where we have a pretty complicated picture already, but it's going to become increasingly comp uh, complicated because over the next three years um, as the EU directive is transposed into local law in each of the 27 member states and um, public pay reporting is required in each of those jurisdictions. We think that this is like at that kind of shift of the decision point where employers that may have had a more kind of decentralized approach to um, thinking of their global pay reporting requirements are, may need to begin, I think will need to begin to think um, about a strategy that it's really coordinated um, so that you can tell your, tell your workplace equity story. Um, I don't know, we were talking about this, I was talking with this with our colleague Nancy Romanishan, um, and we were saying that it really feels like when, right when those pay scale transparency laws um, were sort of beginning on the horizon and we were sitting there with what was happening in New York City with New York City um, passing that law and it felt like oh my gosh as we are looking out on the horizon it's just gonna it's gonna really change the way that we um, think about our our pay transparency of what we're posting on job postings um, and we think that that same shift we're right in the middle of that same shift to a new requirement around global um, pay reporting. Um, I'm just going to go back and Martha had said something and I would kind of mentioned that that in Canada, we had listed Canada as kind of one jurisdiction, but actually there's many different provinces that have British Columbia and 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 many that have um, that have um, global pay reporting um, requirements. On, on the horizon in Canada. So even Canada in and of itself is a complicated jurisdiction um, with even a kind of additional uh, additional obligations. We counted it as one because of the fact that we have um, a national law in Canada, um, but agree with that. So it's so it's so interesting. Um, hey, Christine, can I flag yeah. one other in the question yeah, in the absolutely. Q and A? And yeah. maybe you would get to this too, but um, the question about whether you would envision uh, that France and, and UK requirements would match the EU directive, or would they continue to keep what they have and expand the reporting to match the EU? Yeah, that that is such a great question. And I, I wonder um if if Reese, would you want to take it now or do you want to talk about it in just a second when you're when you're talking about the kind of floor and ceiling? Absolutely. I will address it in just a few seconds. Yeah, perfect. So okay, that's the landscape. Um, and so I was going to turn this over to Ritu right now to talk through kind of what is required with the EU directive and kind of where are we with the EU directive? Thank you very much, Christine. So let's break it down. Uh, so what are the, some of the key requirements of the EU directive? And it can be broken down into five key requirements. Employers will need to ensure equal pay for work of comparative value a greater emphasis on transparency, both through pay and career progression transparency, right to information, pay reporting, which is what the later part of the seminar is going to cover a lot on, and the assessment requirements. And we're going to take each one of these and really break it down, flagging what's unexpected, what are some of the key mindset shifts, 
And how do we create some next steps check checklist for global organizations? But the one thing that I wanted to mention off the top was, whilst we're talking about gender pay, gender-based pay discrimination, the first mindset shift is that the EU directive makes it really clear that gender-based pay inequities may involve an intersection of various axes of discrimination. So on the basis of sex on the one hand and the racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation on the other hand. And I also wanted to mention that this is a very long and meaty directive. Whilst we're going to talk about some of the key features, there are even additional requirements in the directive. So for example, the shifts the burden of proof on pay-related issues. So in cases where a worker feels that the principle of equal pay has not been applied and takes the case to court, national legislation should oblige the employer to prove that there has been no discrimination. And on the next slide, let's talk a little bit about what are some of those pay reporting requirements from the EU directive that companies will need to first calculate and then report on. And the list is right here on the screen that I won't read out. But what I will say is that companies will be required to implement new tactics in order to really battle this gender pay gap, including both annual reporting on gender pay for firms with more than 150 employees and within a three-year review for those with more than 100 staff. The regulation also enables employees to request information related to their own salary and the average pay of those who do the same or similar work broken down by gender. And this reporting needs to be, needs to provide complete transparency around all benefits related to employment contracts in order to really provide more informative data for employers and employees alike. And if you think about it, the accuracy of that information shall be confirmed not only by the employer's management, first it will be through the consultation with works council or workers representatives who will have access to the methodologies applied. And workers and their representatives, whether it's labor inspectorates and equal equality bodies will have the right to ask the employer any additional clarifications and details regarding any of the data provided, including explanations concerning any gender pay differences. And employers will have to respond to all of these requests with a fairly reasonable time frame. And if the average pay gap is at least 5% in any category of the workers, and it is not explained by the objective and general neutral factors, and the gap has not been remediated within the six months of the submission of the pay gap report, employers must actually perform a joint pay assessment in all groups. And this joint pay assessment is in coordination with the works council or the representative. Christine, I don't know if you wanted to add anything here. Yeah, I mean, I think that the one the one thing that is I thought was so fascinating about the EU directive kind of as it landed in the final version um, were a couple of, of things is that, you know, the top portion of it or like the first four, so overall mean and median gap and the um, pay gap on bonuses and the percentage of men and male and female workers that received um, variable comp components of pay, like who received a bonus or who didn't receive a bonus. And then that breakdown by quartile, that felt like we've talked about this a lot, Ritu, that like that feels really, really similar to, the e to what's going on in the UK um, or in Ireland where <clears throat> it's a near lift and shift from those requirements. But that last piece of it, the pay gaps between categories of workers, um, and by that they mean kind of both people that are doing the exact same job and also kind of separately workers uh, that are performing jobs of equal value and the way that that is a big, I think, mindset shift from going from a, um, a a world in which we're thinking about equal pay for equal work to also looking at people that are performing kind of substantially similar roles. I, that just was one of those things that, um, that that strategy around what that looks like, I think is gonna be a pretty big shift. Now it looks kind of similar to what we see in like Sweden, but 
um, and in some of the other jurisdictions, but I think a kind of a big shift, especially if you're an employer um, that's coming at it with an idea of like only comparing people that are doing equal work. This is also requires that we're looking at that broader, that broader look. Absolutely, Christine. And so just going to the other slide, and I always say, guess what? This is not enough. This is not going to be it. The EU directive lays down some of the only the minimum requirements. The directive says that member states can introduce or maintain provisions that are more favorable to workers, but the rules cannot be less favorable. So this is just the beginning of the tipping point. There's going to be many, many, many more things coming in terms of how EU member states actually apply that in reality to their own legislations. Yeah. So like the Dylan, Dylan had asked a question about, do we envision that France or the UK requirements would match the EU directive or will they continue to keep what they have um, and expand the reporting to the to the EU? We were just talking about this right before the right before the webinar. What do you think we do? I mean, in terms of UK, uh, given I'm based in the UK and I often often get asked this question, I'm like, you know, it's only a matter of time when it comes to the law. But forget the law. If I was talking to a CHRO of a really large UK headquartered company, and I said, you know, by the way, it doesn't matter whether the law applies to a UK legislation or not. You have employees globally everywhere, particularly in the EU. So it applies to you. Yeah. So it actually doesn't matter anymore whether UK is included in the EU directive or not anymore. Yeah. Most UK headquartered organizations, or I should say majority, have employees outside of the UK as well. Right. And I don't know, Christine, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like on the on the France piece, um, the for folks that are are um, kind of neck deep in Fran in reporting in France, like our friend Dylan, thanks for that question. Um, and something that we think about a lot at Cindio, the one of the requirements that you would probably remember if you've done any of the reporting in France is this requirement that you're comparing people. Um, on if they had received a pay rise after the time that they had, um, um, after the time that they had returned from maternity leave. And you'll note that that was not one of the requirements that's listed um, as something that you have to report on um, for that kind of initial public pay assessment. They did tuck it under the joint pay assessment so that if you have a gap of more than 5%, one of the things that you're actually going to have to do is look at things like that pay rise. And I think that it was specific. Well, I know that it was because they said it actually in some of the in some of the briefing um, documents that it was to address the fact that there was this kind of side requirement in France um, to look at that. So it's part of that kind of second layer, the joint pay assessment um, portion. So whether or not France says, nope, we want everyone to do that as public as part of their public pay reporting, or if they were satisfied um, because it was included as that kind of secondary joint pay assessment um, analysis. I think is going to be a question that is um, that is kind of an open question. But that was a great that was a great question. And and just just um, Christine, you've already mentioned this quite a bit, but there's been a very clear trend of global cross pollination of pay equity laws in recent years. Uh, while if you think about pay scale transparency and rises in litigations are aspects of the US regulation that have influenced Europe in its latest directive, we can also see Europe's influence in the other direction too. So Europe's focus on the medium pay gap, public reporting and representation metrics were all features also borrowed by the US that have proven really successful. The legislation borrows ideas already in place in a number of cities and countries around the world. So similar to measures recently rolled out in the uh, rolled out in New York uh, City and other parts of the US, firms will have to provide information about the pay level, level or range when advertising open positions. Mm -hmm. So companies will all also have to publish the difference between what men and women are paid every year something that was established in the UK a few years ago and that Japan and Australia have also adopted. Employers won't be allowed to ask prospective workers about their pay history either, finally. So the EU directive will really become the blueprint for workplace equity laws around the globe. I don't know, Christine, did you have any thoughts you wanted to make here? 
No, I, I think that that I just couldn't agree more with that. That it it does feel like some of the some of the things in the EU directive feel like very familiar if you're in the UK because the fact that you, a lot of the kind of public requirements are there with some with some additions. But if you're in the US and you don't have kind of wide scale public pay reporting, that's going to feel very, very different. But we are pretty used to um, pay transparency laws in the US. So I, I, I just like I think that that's right, that we're just going to see like that even frankly, frankly, even if you don't have any employees in the EU, right. it, it matters to you because of the fact that it's the blueprint on, on that go forward basis. Absolutely. And Joni, if you don't mind going to the next slide. And the reality is that global pay reports has so much more than a compliance exercise and are often beginning to serve as the home to public statements about workplace equity. If you want to be an employer of choice, if you want to create an employee experience, and if you want to have an external grade brand, and you know, particularly from an investor's perspective, you ought to not just be thinking about compliance, but rather this is the right thing to do as an organization. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Dan, who's going to dazzle us and talk a little bit about uh, sort of our global pay reports and how we can truly help organizations create a much more holistic, consistent environment for both compliance and analyzing pay. Yeah, thanks, Ritu. Yeah, touch just briefly on um, a little bit, um, just building on this discussion and then what we're hearing from current clients and others that are, you know, knocking on our door and asking how we can we can help. So to set the, set the stage, I think there's kind of three broadly approaches to what we see with global pay reporting. Um, there's kind of a, um, you know, a, an approach on the left, right, which is kind of that decentralized compliance approach. Um, it's country by country, it's local HR that's handling it. And it's less about what Ritu is just describing there in terms of telling the story. And it's more about, you know, getting the job done, you know, the, the reports have a compliance aspect and it's more of a checking, checking the box type exercise. All good and understandable that there's a time and, and, and place for that. However, with the complexity of all this and how it's moving, um, we've seen folks that have been there, you know, thinking about starting to tell their story, right? And so there's worry about it, as probably there is among folks on this call. There's an effort to get it right. There's a desire to get it right. And then again, given the complexity, there's thinking about how to get the the story right and consistent in um, uh, globally, um, and a desire to think about the teams that are involved. Right, um, we're seeing it move um, from kind of solely with folks that are uh, have a compliance perspective to more folks that are kind of leadership folks in compensation and, and total rewards, let alone communication. You know, an employer brand thinking about this. And then lastly, I think if you think of Cindio clients, a lot of them are thinking about that coordinated and sustainable approach. So there's a real effort um, to get this stuff right. There's a, that desire. And there's there's more thinking about the but not just the efficiency of it and the uh, execution on it being right, but also the communication strategy around it as well, given all that's at, at stake as, as Ritu just described there from investors to I don't know, the, the media to employees to future employees, et cetera. Joni, let's move forward. So for those that don't know, in terms of how Cindio um, helps beyond uh, the pay gap reporting, to give you a little bit of context, the Cindio platform um, is great for this global pay reporting piece because it provides a uh, consistent environment for compliance and, and analyzing pay, right? So our global customers use our platform to conduct their pay equity analyses. They're also increasingly analyzing representation and opportunity within the platform. And then now, as Christine announced, we, they can also complete their global pay reports. What's great about that is it facilitates a global fair pay strategy in one platform. It allows a flexible, coordinated analysis um, or, or analyses by country or region. And, um, and even moving forward, given how the landscape is, is changing, there's an opportunity to mitigate risk, right? And get ahead of things because you can model proposed but not yet final legislation in these different jurisdictions to understand what are things gonna look like there and how do you, how do you actually get prepared? Let's move on to the next one. And then briefly, just to show you real quick what it looks like. So you just get the sense that um, there's ease here in, in ways that we can help, right? Within the Cindio platform um, already today, and I'm sure will evolve as, as things evolve moving forward, but you can request as a Cindio client, 
uh, global pay reports in 28 jurisdictions and conduct an EU directive analysis. It's requested in product. All deliverables are vetted by internal legal um, on the Cindio side and an external law firm. Joni, thank you for that. Uh, we'll skip quickly, I think, past this because all you can see here is that you can click a button, one click reporting to get that request done. And if we move to the next one, you'll see here that as you do that, you can select which jurisdictions you need your reports in, and that'll that'll trigger our team to to get the work on on turning those reports around to you. And then we also have um, uh, just on the on the EU directive as well is that's coming that's coming too. So really every every most of the major jurisdictions kind of around the globe we're we're supporting, um, and we're doing it in a way that kind of um, we built it kind of in, intentionally in this way, which is. Um, we we find that you could do it within a within the platform without kind of anyone looking at it, but we could have built it that way. But we actually didn't. We intentionally decided um, that we wanted to have um, our our team of domain experts to be able to um, partner with you as you move through um, as you move through the process. So. If you were to work with Cindio and you decided that you wanted to do all of your global reporting or specific jurisdictions um, in concert with our with our team at Cindio, you would get three kind of core deliverables. So you would get an instruction and guide that gives you this really detailed view of legislation. One of the comments that we got from um, kind of early on in the days is that it's really difficult to find the specific laws and regulations per country, um, given the complicated global nature of those regulations. I loved that so much um, because many of them are in local language. We've it's it's hard. It is not easy to to um, kind of navigate this maze of different um, different reporting obligations. And so what we've done at Cindio is for each of the jurisdictions that we support, we're going to have an instructions and guide that gives you the links to those regulations, outlines how everything is defined, exactly which metrics you need that we will calculate on your behalf, what data you need to pull, how it's defined. Um, and, then, um, and then it provides a roadmap to what the data gathering is um, for filing, as well as providing a model narrative um, where that is required. It's required in some jurisdictions, but not all. Um, we'll also provide you a data template that has the exact fields that you would need to gather the information in order um, to prepare your global pay report. Um, and then once you provide that data um, template back to the Cindio team, Cindio will calculate those metrics um, and provide those model narratives and some general communications advice. Um, if you were to want us to actually put your um, work with you and work with your teams on putting together your global paid reports, we also have an, an optional add-on communications package. So we will surface all of the, the metrics that you need um, as part of this um, global pay reporting. Um, and it's it's awesome. I, I, it's really, I'm just really excited about it because it's, for me, it's been this kind of dream that we, that this is what we needed, that it's really complicated to try to weave through that maze of all of those reporting requirements. And I've wanted for years to be able to put our arms around that. And when we were seeing what was coming with the, with the EU directive, we were just feeling like, every employer is going to need to have those two different strategies. Like it's not enough just to think of, are we paying people equally? Um, are we running a, a pay equity analysis in each of the jurisdictions? You also need to be able to, um, to put these reports together. And I think that that goes to what Ritu talked about in um, so beautifully is that it's more than a compliance exercise because these reports are, are, many of them are very public. They have to be, many of them actually have to be housed on your, on your, um, on your own websites or they're filed in a way that is very public. And all of the EU directive, all of those reports will be public. Um, and so if you're doing this in a way that is like just, just, um, you know, not coordinated, we think that that is, that's you know kind of a miss a missed opportunity to tell your workplace equity um, story. Plus, it's just 
um, easier, frankly, to, to have a, a, a one-stop solution to being able to file these global pay reports. So we're thrilled today to announce the, the launch of Cindio Global Pay Reports. We have a ton of questions that have come in. This is, this is fantastic. Um, do we want to start? Do we want to start taking taking some of these uh, some of these questions that have come in? Um, one of them, I'm just kind of looking through them. Oh, this is a this is an interesting one. Are we seeing public pay gap reporting proposed in the U.S. Um, this year? Do we think that that will pass this year? Um, in the U.S., the if we look at kind of the key pieces of legislation that have been proposed this year, they really fall into two buckets. One of them is additional pay scale transparency laws, and the other one, like we see in New York, um, New York State requires kind of disclosure of representation data, like demographic data, like your EEO one report. But we don't see a huge number of public pay reporting laws that are proposed this year. That's not a big surprise to me because often what happens in the US is this legislation comes in waves and we are right in the middle in the US of the pay scale transparency wave. Um, and we see that happening as part of the EU directive. We see laws in Canada are either already in effect or, or on, the, on the horizon um, on pay scale transparency. Um, and so that's the wave that we're in in the U.S. But as Ritu said, um, this is the blueprint for what's coming next. And when we had um, Senator Limon and Senator Ramos, um, who are the senator in California that was behind the California Pay Transparency Act that also requires mean and median reporting, though not public in the final version, and Senator Ramos from New York State um, who was behind the pay scale transparency law, both of them said that this was something on their longer term horizon. So Senator Limon said that while they didn't get through public pay reporting on the first round of SB 1162, it's certainly on the horizon. And I think what Ritu said is, I, I couldn't agree more, is that it's the blueprint for what's, what's coming. So I wouldn't be one bit surprised if we see much more um, as we look out, you know, a couple of years um, in the U.S. as well. So that's a great, great Christine, question. Christine, as you're reading to the other questions, I can yeah. take Amber's question. Can you confirm the EU requirement is if the pay gap is 5%, this has to be remediated. That's exactly right. If the average pay gap is at least 5% in any category of workers, and it's not explained by objective and gender neutral factors, and that then that gap ha and has not been remediated, then that in, within six months, then the submission of the gender pay gap report, then employers must perform a joint pay assessment. So you're right that the remediation has to be done. Effectively, yeah, effectively you have to remediate it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one of the other questions that we had is, <laughs> oh, one, one of them, this was made me laugh, someone just said, busy pulling out my hair. Um, but the, I think the thing, the nice thing is, I don't think you need to pull out your hair because I think that that was the reason, frankly, that we became, that we are launching Global Pay Reports is that we felt like it was a hair pulling exercise and we didn't want it to feel that way. Um, so that was a good one. Um, Michael had a question. Does the mean, median, and mean um, pay range is the 25th to the 70th percent? Does that 5% variance apply? So um, if we think of it as kind of like two separate requirements, the first one is that you will have to, and the, with the EU directive, the first requirement is that you'll have to post the pay, the salary range for the job. Um, either in the job posting itself or provide it uh, prior to the time um, uh, during the interview process. That range, it doesn't say that that range can only be 5%. That's really whatever is the range for the job. The 5% gap kicks in on that um, provision of the EU directive, which is the public pay gap reporting. So on that public pay gap reporting, you're going to have to go in and identify jobs that are similar and also jobs that are um, of equal value to the organization. And then 
um, it, so analyze if the gap between the pay of men and the pay of women is more than 5%. If it's more than 5%, it doesn't mean that there's a problem necessarily. It means that it, it means that you have to go to the next step. The first next step is that you have to see if you can explain it. So there could be a gap of 5%, but it's because of one person is working in a really high cost of living. They're working in, um, they're working in Paris and we have another, you have another headquarters in a lower cost of living area. Or it could be that the people that are earning 5% more get, uh, have a lot of experience. Um, and so it makes it sense that there would be that gap. So if you can't explain it, then you have to remediate it. If you can't, if you haven't explained it or remediated it, that's when you have to do that global pay assessment. So that was a that was a great question. And Michael, let us know if that didn't answer your question, but I think that I think that, that was the, the question that you were asking. Um, another person asked, what is the process um, for developing um, those groupings of work of equal value? Um, that's a question we get asked a lot. Do you want me to take that Ritu or do you wanna? Okay. Please, please um, go ahead. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so, Many employers have like a global grade structure, like a hay or a, um, you know, an IPE or or one of or one of those. There's there's kind of many of those, and we've heard that there that many employers are kind of planning to leverage those as their way to value equal jobs. It may be that we get more guidance. One of the things in the EU directive that they were very specific on is that they directed each of the member states to provide more guidance on how to compare jobs of equal value. It's possible that it looks like you have to assign a point value to every job, just like you do in, in Canada, for example, in many of the, um, in many of the laws in Canada. Um, or it could be broader that you could use your global grade structure. So I think that that's one of those areas where we have some inklings that there's gonna be of the direction that it may go, but there's also gonna be more guidance to come on how to value jobs of, of equal value. That's a really good question, Katie, thank you. Um, Sarah had a question, a challenge we experience already when trying to analyze pay equity by categories other than gender is that employers need um, race and ethnicity data, which is not consistently available. Do you wanna, do you wanna take that one, Ritu? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a philosophical question to begin with, you know, um, it's that's where the mindset shift thing that we were mentioning earlier in the conversation that US, it's already happening. In the UK, it's getting there. You know, organizations, when you speak with them, they have data 90% of the times when it comes to ethnicity and other protected variables. It's only a matter of time. And if you explain to employees in certain legislations and member states why this data is being collected, employees are actually quite open about self-ID and providing those details. And given that the EU is already suggesting that it, they're making it clear that the gender-based pay inequities may involve an intersection, that whole point about it's not legal anymore to collect will have to go right. away. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it is a little bit philosophical, but I genuinely think we've made progress and we're going to continue to have to make progress. But first, it's a mindset shift. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to require, yeah, for sure. Um, another question is, does the 150 threshold under the EU directive apply to companies with 150 employees in the EU specifically? That's an, another great question. So let's just talk a little bit about the like thresholds. So there's many requirements of the EU directive, requirements like pay scale disclosure requirements, the right to information, the pay range disclosure, the salary history bans, those requirements, those apply if you have in the in each country where you have even a single employee in the in the EU. So for example, let's say you just had five employees in France and you had um, you had you had four employees in Sweden, those requirements would apply to those employees. So they would, you would have to do, there would be a pay scale disclosure requirement that would apply to those employees. There would be the salary history ban would apply to those employees that are that sit within the EU. 
Then there's the kind of last two requirements. And those last two buckets of requirements are the public pay gap reporting and then the joint pay assessment. If you have that gap of more than 5% that you can't explain and you haven't remediated, then you have to go into that joint pay assessment. But for those last two requirements, it applies initially if you have 150 or more employees in each in each member state. So because the way that the EU directive is going to roll out, which is it has to be transposed into law in each member state, let's say that you had five employees, you had those five employees in France and you had the four employees um, in Sweden, but you had a thousand employees in Germany, you would have to do the public pay gap reporting um, and uh, uh, if there were the gaps and they weren't remediated, et cetera, the, the joint pay assessment just for the employees in Germany. You wouldn't be incorporating the employees that are in France where you just had five or in Sweden where you just had the four employees. It would just be for that larger bucket of employees where you had um, the thousand um, employees or 150 employees in, 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 where, in, uh, in one of the member states. Um, and then that 150 threshold after five years will roll down to a hundred or more. So um, the threshold will go down a little bit. Um, oh, this is a great question. So one of our biggest challenges is not the analysis. Cause you're right, in many ways, some of these analyses are fairly, um, are not terribly difficult, but it's in getting the da right data from, from payroll um, and understanding the definitions. Totally hear you. That is actually the exact reason um, why on our global pay reporting, you get the three deliverables. So you're gonna get this instruction sheet that, um, and it's a, an additional kind of add-on, um, it's an add-on to your global, if you're already working with Cindio, it'd be an add-on to what you what you currently have for many, talk to your CSM, but um, so you would get the instruction guide that would say, here's exactly how each of these things are defined. And you would also get a data template that would have for France, here's the exact data that you need here for Australia, here's the exact data here for, for um, you know, Israel, here are the exact requirements for California, where, what have you, um, because we agree with that and totally. Um, Another one is today, as a French group, we tackle every local obligations country by country. So we calculate the scores within France for French entities, according to the French law. Um, and does it mean that you're going to have to do it across Europe? And no, it doesn't actually. You'll still be doing it um, jurisdiction by jurisdiction because the law is going to be transposed into local law in each of the 27 member states. So there'll be kind of 27 versions of that law, um, which is in some ways a benefit, but in some ways is adds complication because it means that you have so many reporting requirements. Um, do, is there a definition of category of what workers in the EU law? So there is a definition, but it's an incredibly broad definition. Um, and so unfortunately, it's one of those things where um, one of the things that they say in the directive is that they are going to um, provide more guidance on what, what, is, what is required. Um, oh, good question. Morgan had a great question. When does each country need to trans? Um, transpose the reg regulation into local law. Okay, so this is the timeline. So the timeline is this: we were right now the um, the final vote occurred, but it still needs to be confirmed by the European Council and then published in the official journal. As soon as it's published in the official journal, that starts a twenty day clock. Once the end of that twenty day clock then that kicks off the process where each of the member states will have to transpose the law. From that date, they'll have up to three years to transpose the law, but during the debate around the EU directive, this had been going on for more than nine years. They started this process of moving towards the EU directive nine years ago, which is just mind-blowing. And so what they said is that, you know, a lot of the member states have had this 
on the books for a long time and they encouraged member states not to wait. So it's very possible that the member states will not wait all the way till the ends of that three years. And Richard, do you wanna talk about your, you, you've made a great observation to me many times is that once one starts, it, they, the it member, it's a, it's a, uh, a race that at that point, yeah, I mean, I call it FOMO, simply, you know, one state <laughs> or one jurisdiction is doing something, others want to follow suit because these get discussed in boardrooms now. This isn't a matter of compensation experts just doing the work. This is becoming very high profile and visible work across the boards. And, you know, when you talk about talking about a global organization and you're doing some work in France and Spain, they want to know how we're tackling this globally for our workforce. So it does go beyond the compliance exercise. And sorry, Christine, I just want to add to what Marta asked about the same thing yeah. around GDPR, around collecting some of this data. You're absolutely right, Marta. There is a challenge, but there is a mindset shift happening very slowly, but surely across EU, across Europe, that we can do self-ID. Rather than collect data by through surveys, there are options for organizations to say, if employees choose to and wish to, we can get them to self-ID some of that dem demographic information, which we otherwise can't collect. And when there is a good communication where employees understand why this self-ID re is required, most employees are like, yes, I'd like that. I'd like to know how my organization is stacking up, not just on gender, but on ethnicity, on, di on disability, on sexual orientation and whatnot. So it's only a matter of time. It's definitely going to be removed as a law because the EU directive will require intersectional analysis. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take one last question. And Dan, I was going to see if you would join us in this conversation, which is um, Eva asked, perhaps it's too early to talk about, but frankly, Eva, I think that you're right on the right spot. But are there that, there, that you're going to have to have overlapping strategies, one for global pay reporting and then for your global pay analysis? So I just was curious um, about what you're hearing, Dan, because you talk to you talk to so many employers about kind of what they're thinking about this. You'd of course be the expert on the on the the legal aspects of how you mm -hmm. conduct your pay equity analysis, but I think the thematically what we're hearing is there just needs to be a um, uh, a more um, centralized strategy and thinking around how are we approaching this work? What are the definitions globally of what we mean by pay equity, what we mean by fair pay, um, what we mean by pay parity, all these, this vernacular that's out in the world and that that leaders and companies are struggling with how to exactly get this right. I think this whole rubric relates to just having clarity of purpose um, and a strategy that helps you both get the execution of the compliance uh, pieces right, but also more broadly, um, get your compensation right and get your communication with employees, investors, and the world correct as well. So right. So right. Um, well, this has been amazing. There's so many questions. The ones that we haven't gotten to will we'll, um, we'll reach back out to you. Um, if you're interested in learning more and you're a Cindio customer, you can actually click the button in the in the platform itself, like at the top, as Dan said, that you can request a report. Or if you would like, if you just drop a, your email address or your name um, to the host and panelists, um, if you just listed your name um, on the host and panelists, we'll, and you're interested in hearing more about what the about Cindio Global Pay Reports, definitely do that now. That would be fantastic. And we'll make sure to reach out to you. If you're not a current Cindio customer, do, you can do the same thing. Um, and one of our team members can reach out to you um, to share more information. Um, we, um, you can also, we're going to be doing, uh, uh, you could also request a one-on-one -on -one demo at this link cindio.com slash demo. Um, and we can demo the full platform or just talk about the global pay reports, whatever, whatever you need. Um, it would be fantastic. Um, we're also going to have a live demo. Dan, are you doing this one? Are you doing this? Yeah. Demo? Yes. Okay. Do so you want to tell us about it? Oh, we'll do it having a live demo soon. So feel free to take either action that Christine suggested. We're happy to talk one on one, but but if the timing works, you could join this session on on May second to do sort of a high level demo as well. Perfect. And then also, cindio.com dash 
podcast. We have um, Maria Colacurcio, our CEO, has this amazing podcast, um, and it's called The Shift. Um, so definitely, and there's going to be a really, really big guest coming up. So I will just, I won't. So it's good. It's good to check it out because there's going to be um, a pretty exciting guest that's going to be coming up really, really quickly. Um, thank you again all so much for joining. Feel free to either click the link or, or just drop a number and we'll, we'll definitely be in, in touch with more information. Um, thanks so much. And we're always here. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.